Hi, everybody. Uh, Jason Burke from the MPA program here. And again, we're here with Professor Rahima Jabbar Bey um, talking about leadership development. And today, what we're going to really talk about is building leadership capacity in other people. So, Professor Jabbar Bey, thank you again for being with us. Um, You're welcome. I have just a few questions for you. We're going to learn a lot. <laughs> so, the first question I have. Um, is how do you identify or select the people that you're going to put your effort into building? And is there a specific type of person that you, you usually look for to, uh, to build their leadership capacity? Well, Dr. Berg, one of the things that I really thought about when I reviewed all of the questions in that segment, I have to share, and I hope that everyone will understand it, and I'll help you understand it. It's kind of tinged with elitism, okay? And what I mean by that, just the phrasing, people you would select, rather than thinking about of the, all these X number of people, wherever they might be in a neighborhood, a community, an association or not, whatever, who would be interested in further developing their leadership skills? Each of us actually have leadership skills. So again, leadership, the question shouldn't be who should you try to select, but think about people you've encountered. Now, maybe you've only encountered your peer group, wherever you are, you're working, you're in school, you're working on a graduate degree, maybe those are the only people you've really encountered. But if you want to work in communities, in neighborhoods, towns, whatever, you need to get out there and meet people and meet them where they are. Don't make it up in your head. Oh, these are low-income people. These are poverty-stricken people. They probably don't know or they don't have. You don't know that. That is only one aspect of who people might be, their wealth. If you think about your own wealth, if you were only judged by your own wealth, oh, <laughs> that wouldn't be a good one. So. Think about people who might want to increase, improve, build upon their own leadership at whatever level it may be. And I'm gonna give you some suggestions. The first thing I said was get out there. You've gotta go into neighborhoods, go into small towns, whatever way you think you can meet people. If it's a civic association, you may not be religious, but you might need to go into a church or a mosque or a synagogue to meet people and see and who see who they are and what their interests are by listening first, not asking. So it sounds like you're not selecting leaders, but leaders are stepping up themselves. Yes. And we don't always see it. That's why we have to sit back and observe before we start speaking. <laughs> Especially we often, because we're quote educated, we have it's kind of that, it's sincere, I believe. Oh, let me share what I know, what I've learned. I'm certain this would be helpful. But that could come off as, excuse me, you don't even know me. You don't know what I know, what I don't know. You don't know what circumstances I have. You're making assumptions. So get to know people. So what are the most common challenges you have to help a person overcome? I think the most common challenges for people who actually would like to further develop their leadership capacities is that for some reason, and a lot of it is the way we've been socialized, I mean, as a society, oh, leaders, wow, leaders are usually corporate figures. <laughs> They're in business, they're the head of corporations, they might be elected to some high office. A leader might be someone who's the head of an organization. So it's kind of like that appointed leadership or leadership based on the rugged individualism. People still believe in that. You know, like I made it to CEO, I founded my company and I'm CEO. And it's always interesting to me that the CEO of a large corporation 
is given more value than that person in a low wealth community who creates his or her own, her own business and they're the only employee, but they're doing great. That's leadership too. And that's success. But anyway, we tend to think of people who have titles as being leaders. So me as a leader, and often I feel that I'm being, you know, pushed around or moved around socially, politically, economically by others. So really, am I a leader? And you can help people think about, number one, you lead yourself. Number two, if you have a partner, a wife, a husband, you have a leadership role and it's, and it's you know, it's mutual. Sometimes you lead, sometimes I lead, but we discuss things. And then when you have a family, you're definitely in a leadership role because you're modeling and teaching what you want your children to see so that they will be engaged in certain ways how they see themselves and interact with others. So it's a matter of helping a person recognize themselves as a leader? Recognize their strengths because often, especially in the areas that you guys are looking in, leadership in communities, leadership in the public sector, leadership in the private sector, leadership in our nonprofit sector. Often those people who are in those positions, whether it's the top or the middle, they tend to look at those who are receiving their services as not being leaders, but being people who only receive services because they don't know how to direct their own well-being. And that's not necessarily the case. There are many external factors that impede upon certain people and groups of people, and I can name them in our society that will hinder, hamper, or even prevent those individuals and those groups from exercising leadership. So you really do have to work with people and you do that through engagement, not through lessons and, you know, directing things to them. You do that through engaging, sincere engagement, where you can actually establish a personal relationship of trust. How do you help a person overcome a lack of confidence in their abilities? Well, I think one of the most powerful ways is to help people give them examples of the reality that even those people they believe are in leadership positions, <laughs> you know, have doubts and fears and anxieties <laughs> and often hide those because they know that people are looking toward them for whatever, for answers, problem solving, or even just the way to carry yourself if you are a leader. But to help people recognize that those insecurities exist in every human being, even though many people will mask those insecurities. So we're not that different from one another. And then we also have to help people who, who have kind of internalized this belief that they could, their followers are not leaders and everything is being done to them or, you know, on them is to also help them to understand what the systemic internalized inequities are. I'm telling you, many people hear those words, but they still don't understand what it means and how systemic inequities are carried out in the workplace, in schools, right? And social service uh, providers and in the nonprofit sector. Nonprofits don't like me some of them don't like me to talk about that, but there's a difference between the models of nonprofit service. You can have nonprofits that only try to provide social services to those who are less fortunate. That's one model. 
The other model is developing the human capacity of people who often are only, quote, impoverished or unfortunate because of systems, not because of their own inadequacies. So helping people to develop and build who they can be is one avenue of nonprofit work. And the other avenue is about providing services, which tends to keep people in a position of only receiving services, not developing their own innate capabilities. One of the things that I remember you teaching me um, when I started doing this kind of work with you was the importance of celebrating victory. Oh. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. <laughs> celebrating victories, small, medium, and large. Some, sometimes we just celebrate the end product or the big thing, right? We have to celebrate incrementally. So when there's an incremental victory, you know, it's like part of a bigger objective. Acknowledge it and celebrate it. Acknowledge who helped make that peace come to fruition, become a reality. You don't wait for, oh, we've, we raised all the money, you know, or we were able to establish our, our code of ethics, or we've, we determined the best way to use social media. But there were steps that you had to identify and meet. And then when you were able to culminate that step, you need to celebrate, like we did it, you did it. He and she, whatever. You, you two guys, thank you, you did that. Now we can move to step C or step eight, whatever. But ex acknowledge and celebrate. And acknowledgement is so key. None of us gets everything done by ourselves. I don't care what it is, okay? So if you have the, oh my gosh, if you are in a position where two or three other people are part of this effort, whatever the effort is, and each of you have taken on some aspect or a part of an assignment, when each of you actually culminates that, and that means now we can go to the next piece or the next level. Acknowledge who did it, thank who did it, celebrate it. Because without those incremental victories, we won't get to the end goal. So yes, it's important. And plus it gives people energy and it also demonstrates your leadership. <laughs> I recognize that we came together and although I might have been the one to make outreach to you, or maybe you were the one to make outreach to me, I'm not putting myself above either of you or any of you. So when any of us get something done, whether it's the whole thing or a part of it, we celebrate it. We acknowledge who made it happen, and we all go, yes, this is great. Now we can move forward. And even when there's a setback, you don't go into the woe is me because you don't want people to feel like they are not competent and capable. Who doesn't make a mistake? If, if any of us can say, I've never made a mistake, I wanna meet you, okay? We need to put you in the Guinness Book of Records or something. Never made a mistake. So even then you rally around that person, either as an individual or as a group. Okay, no problem. Let's go back to the drawing board. Let's figure out how to get this done. And Ken, is there anything we can do to help or I can do to help? It's really important. It makes people feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves and they've contributed and they want to do, they will want to do more. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this conversation today. Oh, I really appreciate you coming and sharing all of your, your expertise and your knowledge and, and insights with us. Um, and I, I do look forward to talking to you again. Same here. 